Yeah. All right, good morning, everybody. Good morning. I'd like to welcome everyone to class this morning. You should have in front of you a set of notes for uh, lesson 32 Internal Evidence of Inspiration, Undesigned Coincidences, Part 2. Mm -hmm. So, we looked at some of this material last week, and it was basically a uh, I, I retaught through material that Craig had taught in the summer of 2014 and I told you that this week we'd be looking at some other things and that's what we're going to be looking at today as they relate to Paul's epistles in the book of Acts. So last week in lesson 21 we began looking at internal evidence of inspiration. Under the following general category, under the following general category of internal evidence for inspiration, I said that we would consider the following points. Number one, we'd look at undesigned coincidences. And second, we would look at fulfilled prophecy. Last week, with the help of uh, William Paley, Dr. Timothy McGrew, and Craig Holcomb, we studied the general concept of undesigned coincidences and looked at examples in the four Gospels. In doing so, we concluded that, evident, that this evidence, undesigned coincidences in the Gospels, points to independent testimony. The Gospels are four separate witnesses giving, giving accurate, faithful accounts of historical events. These undesigned coincidences serve as internal proof of the Bible's inspiration. Only a book written under divine inspiration would exhibit characteristics such as these. So just remember we talked about the how there would be things in one gospel that were sort of that appeared to be like throwaway statements or statements you scratch and say what's he talking about here or whatever and then you go to another gospel or even another couple gospels and how you sort of triangulate those statements and you get a, a good understanding of, of what's going on and how those those sorts of things help demonstrate that the Bible was written by a divine author, that they're not forged documents, that they're not just copies copying each other. And uh, we, we looked at those things as internal evidence of inspiration. So this morning I want to consider some examples of undesigned coincidences in Paul's epistles. This seems prudent given the fact that our assembly believes that Paul is the apostle of the Gentiles for the current dispensation of grace. So I couldn't really, I couldn't let this undesigned coincidence this thing go without looking at some Pauline examples. Okay, um, and what you're going to see here as we look at the Book of Acts and we look at Paul's epistles is the same sort of phenomenon that we saw last week, where the books, where Paul's epistles are are authenticating the Book of Acts and vice versa. Okay. So, undesigned coincidences in Paul's epistles. In his Hor Paulinae, uh, 1790, William Paley examines the book of Acts on the one hand and the Pauline epistles on the other with a view to showing how each might illustrate the other. Well, uh, Paley's Hor Paulinae was, was the first work to explore this sort of argument in detail. Paley's object is to show the numerous correspondences between Paul's epistles and the book of Acts. This whole idea of an undesigned coincidence, as far as I can tell, is introduced into the thought stream of the discussion by Paley in 1790 through this work that he writes, Hor Paulinae, where he discusses these touching points between the book of Acts and Paul's epistles. Paley states in the first chapter of Hor Paulinae that indirectness, the evident undesignedness, is what makes these coincidences significant. The information that makes the, that makes the passages from the epistles interlock with the history is dropped casually and naturally into the narrative. By contrast, although there is a very close verbal parallel between Paul's description of the Last Supper in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 24 and 25, the words uh, the, uh, and the words of institution in Luke 20, 22, 17 through 20. Now, you got to understand, Paley is not necessarily a rightly dividing dispensationalist here, okay? This coincidence uh, might might easily be explained by the hypothesis that one is the source, one of the sources copied from the other. <clears throat> this is not to say that either author actually did copy from the other, but when the points of coincidence are too obvious, this correspondence might have been forged after the historical work, work became well known and vice versa. So what McGrew is saying there is essentially the fact that, again, if, if you're going to forge things, and if you're going to copy things after the fact, you're not going to have these sorts of incongruencies and, and strange occurrences that are just dropped into the text if you're a forger or you're somebody copying after the fact. And you're, gonna, you're not going to have that. You're going to have a smooth, um, 
a, a smooth reading thing that doesn't exhibit these types of things. If there were only a small number of undesigned coincidences, we might shrug them off as statistical noise. After all, in a large box of, of jigsaw puzzle pieces taken at random, one piece may, di may for many one piece from many different puzzles, somehow searching with great patience, might find a few pairs that fit together, more or less, by sheer accident. But when a large number of pieces fit together, sometimes in clusters, the chance, the chance explanation rapidly becomes absurd. That is why, to appreciate the force of the argument from undesigned coincidences, we must have the patience to work through multiple examples. But the picture that emerges when we take time to do this will amply repay us for the labor and study we bestow on the project. So, look, if you took randomly some pieces from a puzzle, could you maybe get them to fit? But you certainly couldn't do that for the whole what? For the whole thing, right? So what he's saying here is you, know, you might be able to randomly find some things by chance or by luck or by coincidental occurrence that fit together, right? But when you start to see that type of interlocking on a wide scale across a, a great number of, of the New Testament books, you start to realize that this is not something that somebody, um, th this is not the result of forging or copying, okay? So I have here, I can't even remember how many of these I set forth, but we're going to look at some uh, of these examples. Last week I think we looked at eight from the Gospels, and I think I have about six this week from Paul's epistles. So why don't we get in, why don't we get in one hand, 1 Corinthians 1, 1 Corinthians 1 and Acts 18. 1 Corinthians 1 and Acts 18. Now some of these, some of these you may already be familiar with. I can't remember if I pointed some of these out already when we went through our study on 1 Corinthians. But even if I did, the audience that is possibly listening to this class maybe hasn't gone through all the material from our 1 Corinthians study. So the first one, Pauline uh, undesigned coincidence number one, I am of Paul and I am of Apollos. Okay? So look at 1 Corinthians chapter 1 first. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 12. We're actually going to be talking more about this this morning later. He says, verse 12, Now this I say that every one of this I say that every one of you saith, I am of Paul, and I am of Apollos, and I am of Cephas, and I am of Christ. Then go to chapter 3, look at verse 6. Chapter 3, verse 6. He says, I planted Apollos what? watered, right? So both of these verses suggest that Apollos had been at Corinth. The second also suggests that Paul had what? Preceded him there. Now how do you get that from chapter 3 verse 6? In the order of growing you have to plant and then what? And then water, right? So the, the implication is that Paul was there first followed by who? Apollos. Come over to Acts 18. Acts chapter 18, verse 19, it says, And he came to Ephesus and left them there, but he himself entered into the synagogue and reasoned with the Jews. Verse 23, And after he had spent much time, time there, he departed and went over all the country of Galatia and Phrygia in order, strengthening the disciples. Verse 26, So Paul leaves. Right? He leaves Corinth, correct? Okay? Verse 24. And a certain Jew named Apollos, born in Alexandria, an eloquent man and mighty in Scripture, came to Ephesus. This man was instructed in the way of the Lord, and being fervent in the Spirit, he spake and taught diligently the things of the Lord, knowing only the baptism of John. And he began to speak boldly in the synagogue, uh, whom when Aquila and Priscilla had heard, they took, they took him unto them and expounded unto him the way of God more perfectly. And when he was disposed to pass into Achaia, the brethren wrote, exhorting the disciples to receive him, much, receive him, excuse me, whom when he was come, helped them much, which, which had believed through grace, for he mightily convinced the Jews, and that publicly, showing by the scriptures that Jesus was the Christ. Verse, chapter 19, verse 1. And it came to pass that while Apollos was where? Okay, now, if all you had was 1 Corinthians, does 1 Corinthians suggest that Apollos had been at Corinth? Does it suggest that he had been there after Paul? Okay, so now you come over here to the book of Acts. So reading from my notes, after his first visit to Greece, Paul went from Corinth to Ephesus. 
where he left his companions, Priscilla and Aquila, and he returned to Palestine, stopping in Jerusalem, and then went north into Asia Minor. We saw that in Acts 18, verse 19 and 23. Ultimately making his way back to Ephesus. It is during the period after these later travels that Apollos comes on the scene, being instructed in Ephesus by Priscilla and Aquila, Acts 18, 26. And passing, from, and passing forth... And passing from them over to Achaia, where he greatly helped those who through grace had believed, Acts 18.27, we, we might have inferred from this alone that Apollos, went, that Apollos went to Corinth on this trip. But we need to stop here as we find Paul came back to Ephesus at the very time that Apollos was at Corinth. So go back to Acts 19 verse 1. And it came to pass that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul, having passed through the upper coast, came where? To Ephesus, right? So you can see not only, are they, not only are they giving you the same order of events that Paul was in Corinth first and then Apollos, but they're also showing you where they're at in relationship to each other at a particular what? At a particular time, right? When Apollos shows up at Corinth, where's Paul? Ephesus. He's in Ephesus, okay? So you see that there's, that there's a, a touching point here where the book of Acts and the book of 1 Corinthians are working together here to help explain what's going on. Now that one's pretty easy, okay? That one's sort of like a no-brainer. You can just read Acts 18 and 19. You can read 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 1 and chapter 3 and pretty much figure that one out. There's some other ones, though, that are a little bit more interesting. Come with me to the second one is letters of commendation. Come with me to 2 Corinthians 3. Come over to 2 Corinthians 3. Now, I would say that for, and I don't think I'm going too far out on a limb here to say this. I would say that for us that study Paul's epistles and view them as our instruction for this dispensation of grace, we're used to looking at things that are said in the epistles and then coordinating with when those things happen when in the book of Acts, right? I mean, that's something that we do fairly often in our studies together. Last summer, when the brethren were teaching through 1 Thessalonians and 2 Thessalonians, how many times in that study did we look at things that were being said in, in 1 and 2 Thessalonians and go back to the book of Acts and show how those things were working together there, right? So this concept is not really necessarily new for those of us that understand that, that Paul is our apostle and we study his epistles in that way. However, if you're not used to doing that, which many out there are not, they may not be aware of these sorts of things. Okay? And even within that, there are some that are a little bit more obscure and, and more interesting than others. So get 2 Corinthians 3. Did you have a comment, Craig? Get 2 Corinthians chapter 3 in one hand and Acts 18 in the other. 2 Corinthians 3 and Acts 18. Okay. So there is a further point of coincidence, equally indirect, between the passage of Acts and an expression Paul uses when um, <clears throat> remonstrating with the Corinthians in his second epistle. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 1. He says, Do we begin again to commend ourselves, or need we as some others epistles of what? commendation to you or letters of commendation from you. Ye are our epistle written in our hearts, known and read of all men. So there in verse 1 he's talking about letters of what? I was talking to a, a brother, a, a, a grace preacher up north of here and we were having a discussion and he said that he wished that people would come into his assembly with, with, letter, with letters of commendation from where they were before. <laughs> And uh, I thought about that, and I said, eh, that, that would be nice if that could happen in some situations. But go over to Acts 18. Go over to Acts 18. So this issue with Apollos, okay? We see Apollos in verse, 20, in verse 24, 25, look at 26. And he, began to, and he began to speak boldly in the synagogue, whom when Aquila and Priscilla had heard, took him unto them, and expounded unto him the way of God more perfectly. Now look at verse 27. And when he was disposed to pass into Achaia, what's the next, what's it say next? Wrote, exhorting the disciples to what? Repent. 
receive him, whom when he was come helped them much, which had believed through grace. You see how that verse mentions the fact that before Apollos left, there were things written exhorting the, exhorting the disciples there to receive him. You see that? Okay. So look at the notes. Acts 18.27, as it happens, as it happens, the book of Acts provides the clue to Paul's language. For when Apollos, having been instructed by Priscilla and Aquila, made his own trip to Corinth, the brothers encouraged him and wrote to the disciples to welcome him. So when Apollos shows up, does he have these letters of, co of commendation? Yeah. yeah. Acts 18 shows you that. What should we infer from the way the book of Acts interlocks with the Corinthian epistles? The examples we have looked at here offer us some evidence that the authors of each, now this is important, that the authors of each were well informed and habitually truthful. That falls short of a demonstration, of course, but all historical evidence falls short of mathematical demonstration. The case is a prima facie one, and it would be strengthened if we would find other similar arguments with respect to these texts. Paley gives a dozen for each of these epistles. So we're only going to look at two, right? He gives you 12 for 1 Corinthians, he gives you 12 for 2 Corinthians. If you look at everything Paley says in uh, Hor Polonae from 1790, he shows you 12 from each of these places where 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians interlock with what book? The book of Acts, okay? Um, any questions before we go to number three? Mike, do you have a question? No, I'm just I'm amazed. You know, this guy is really uh, a good researcher. Uh, he didn't have TV. <laughs> he didn't have a computer. He didn't have Netflix. And, yeah, I, I agree with you. I mean, you, you, you see these things, and how many times do you just read over that? Yeah, I never read like that. And then you read over it again over there in 2 Corinthians, like, oh, that's interesting. And you never what? You never put it together, right? So, number three is the contribution for the poor saints at Jerusalem. Right. Yeah. I will say, though, that once you know this, and once you know they're there, you will start seeing them. Yeah. Um, it's funny, my, I, I told my dad when he was visiting at the end of January, remember they were in town for Andrew's birthday and they were in church, and I said I was going to be doing this, and him and I talked about it. And he said, well, when you're done doing those lessons on those undesigned coincidences, I want you to send them to me. So I sent him the video from last week's and my notes, and he went through it. And I talked to him on the phone the next day, and he was giving me like seven more things that he said, well, you should have said this, and you should have said that. And he was giving me a bunch more things that, um, a, a coincidences of where they line up. And he, was also, he also told me that he thinks the best one, in his opinion, is the one where John tells you, where Jesus says in John, in three days I'll destroy this temple and, and raise it up and so forth, right? But the other three Gospels don't tell you that. And he says he thinks that's the strongest one because it demonstrates the connection between those three and John. Now, that's... That's obviously, I, I don't disagree with that. I think that is a fascinating thing and a strong proof. But the point is, to Craig's point, once you're aware of this, when you read, you will start to, you will start to pick up on things along these lines that you may have missed previously. Okay? So the third one is the contribution for the poor saints at Jerusalem. One of the benefits of having both Paul's letters and a history of Paul's activities, the book of Acts, uh, from another hand, that is from a different author, is that we are able to compare points of contact across the two genres. Their overlap in all the more valuable since they appear to have been written largely or wholly independently of one another with very little verbal similarity at any point. So again, if you're copying, you're going to have verbal borrowing. Right? Where you're going to be using that same language. We talked about that last week when we looked at the epistle to, uh, of Peter. What should we expect from such material? If each is independently grounded in the facts. With luck and with, material in, and with the material in existence, we should be able to find multiple instances of where the documents refer to the same people or events. Of course, we should not expect the history and the letters to correspond point for point. 
In the nature of the case, there will be much in the letters that will be out of place in the history, while in the history, in keeping with the historical standard of the times, may organize material conceptually rather than chronologically, and may compress or pass over some incidents in the course of the narration. And occasionally the correspondences may cross correspondences may cross over several letters creating a network of related passages that cannot with that cannot with any plausibility be dismissed as fabrication or forgery so what he's saying there is in the letters are the are, are the epistles letters addressed to churches and individuals is that a different sort of writing than what Luke's doing in the book of acts where he's setting forth the history so not only do you have not only do you have the fact that they're written by different authors, but you have the fact that as far as the, the, the genre of the writing is not what? Is not the same, right? So when Paul's writing letters to either persons or churches, he'll mention things that the people in those churches will what? No. Will know or under people or whatever that the, that the people in those churches will know that when Luke writes the book of Acts, he's not interested in what? He's not interested in doing that. He's interested in telling you what? What happened in sort of the order of the events, right? So let's get a few here. Get, let's start, to start with, get Romans 15 and Acts 20. So we'll just start with two. Get Romans 15 and Acts 20. Romans 15, we'll look at 25 and 26. Verse, verse 25, Romans 15, 25. But now I go unto Jerusalem to minister unto the saints. And then he says, For it hath pleased them of Macedonia and Achaia to make a certain contribution for the poor saints which are where? At Jerusalem. So look at the notes. Here we have three points of interest all in the same passage in one of the letters. A collection being taken up in Macedonia, a similar collection in Achaia, and Paul's plan to travel to Jerusalem and take this collection or this aid to the saints there, right? So you see that it's going on that um, the collection is being taken up in verse 26 in Macedonia and Achaia, and you see that the intention of the contributions being made is for the poor saints which are at Jerusalem. Go over to Acts 20. Verse 2. Well, verse, we look at verse 1 first. And after the uproar was ceased, Paul called unto him the disciples and embraced them and departed, and departed for to go where? Into Macedonia. Now, is that one of the places that Romans 15 said the collection was being taken up? Okay, so keep that in mind. And when he had gone over those parts and had given them much exhortation, he came into Greece and there abode three months. And when the Jews laid and when the when the Jews laid wait for him, as he was about to sail into Syria, he purposed to return through where? Macedonia. So in those verses, we find Paul on his way back to Palestine, but there's not a single word there about there being any what? Any contribution, any collection being taken up, right? So go over to Acts 24. Acts 24, verse 17. Now after many years, I came to bring alms to my nation and what? Offerings, whereupon certain Jews from Asia found me purified in the temple, neither, neither uh, with multitude nor with tumult. Who ought, to have, who, who ought to have been there before thee and object if they, ought, if they had ought against me. Now, Paul mentions here that he came to Jerusalem to do what? Bring alms. Bring alms to his countrymen, right? But there is no mention of where the money comes from. So think about that. Romans 15 says that he made a took up a collection where? In Macedonia and Achaia with the purpose of bringing it where? Yeah. 
Acts 20 tells you that he's in Macedonia. It tells you where he's going on his way back to Jerusalem. But does he say anything about the contribution of the collection? Then you come to Acts 20, and Paul mentions the fact that he, he, he came there to bring alms from his countrymen, but he doesn't tell you where any of the money what came from. Now go to first. Di, so the points of correspondence are so indirect in this case that there is no suspicion of copying here. Two other passages from the letters enable us to fill out the picture. So go, back, go to 1 Corinthians 16. First Corinthians 16, now concerning the collection for the saints, as I had given order to the churches of Galatia, even, even so do ye. Now all, now all of a sudden he's talking about what? Collection. Upon the first day of the week, let every one of you lay before him in store, as God hath, if God, as God hath prospered him, that there be no gatherings when I come. And when I come, however, ye shall approve, ye shall approve by your letters, them will I send to bring your liberality unto where? Unto Jerusalem. And if I be meet that I go also, they shall go with me. Okay? So here we see that there was a contribution being collected at Corinth, the capital of Achaia. Now, Romans, Romans 15 said that there, the collection was being taken up in Macedonia and where? Achaia. Now, here Paul in 1 Corinthians, he's writing to them, and he's talking to them about that collection that's going to go to Jerusalem. And we learn that it's happening in Corinth, and Corinth just so happens to be the capital of the region of Achaia. Now, you, look, you can't, you, you, you can't do that unless you're God writing. Okay, you can't have these things interlocking like this unless the author of all of these books is God the Holy Spirit and he knows what he said in each of the other what? Each of the other books. Come to 2 Corinthians 8. Well, and unless they're Right. 2 Corinthians 8, verse 1. So 1 Corinthians talked to you about Achaia. Now watch, watch 2 Corinthians 8. Moreover, brethren, we do you to wit of the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia, how that in great, trail of, uh, in great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abounded unto the riches of their liberality. For to their power I bear ye record, and beyond their power they were willing of themselves, Praying us with much entreaty that we would receive the gift and take upon us and take upon us the fellowship of ministering to the saints. So he's talking about a collection that was being taken up where? In Macedonia. What did Romans 15 say about where the collections were being taken? Macedonia and Achaia, right? Go, come over quick, chapter 9, look at verse 2. For I know the forwardness of your mind. For which I boast of you to them in Macedonia, that Achaia, so now you learn that, uh, concretely that Corinth is where? In Achaia, that Achaia was ready a year ago, and your zeal hath provoked very many. So if you go to the notes, we find the churches of Macedonia uh, introduced as already engaged in a collection for this very purpose. So thus, all of the circumstances brought together in those two verses in Romans are corroborated by a number of other passages in the history of Acts and in the Corinthian epistles. And each of these, by some hint in the passage, or by the date of the writing in which the passage occurs, can be fixed at a particular time. A period toward the close of Paul's second missionary journey. Does this conformity, scattered and indirect, with not a whiff of verbal similarity, look like forgery on the on look like forgery on one part or on the other? Or rather, does each passage stand perfectly, naturally, in connection with its own context? If so, the suggestion that such a coincidence is the effect of design is most improbable. Look at what we just did. We started in Romans 15, right? Yeah. 
And we went to Acts 20. We went to Acts, what it was, a 24? Or 23 or 24? 24. Acts 24, 1 Corinthians 16, and 2 Corinthians. And you, you, you go all through all those things, and you get the full understanding of what was going on with that collection. Okay? So the book of Acts, or the Pauline epistles, are verbally independent. Their interconnections are indirect. That is what makes their harmony so impressive as evidence that both give us substantially truthful representations of real events. Is everybody following this? Okay. This, this to me is outstanding internal evidence for the Bible's divine origin and inspiration. The fact that you have these things occurring and you don't see copying and, and, or as McGrew, what McGrew would call verbal borrowing. Any questions or comments? So there we see, in that example, we saw Romans, 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, and the book of Acts. All I, I don't like to use this word because it has political implications and stuff, but they're sort of all triangulating themselves together, right? And they, they're all connected, but their connectedness is of such a nature that it's clear that they're not just copying each other or forging things. A fourth example is Aquila and Priscilla. So go to Romans 16 and get, get Romans 16 and Acts 18 again. Romans 16 and Acts 18. So there are certain points of Paul's letters that we typically pass over in silence. I would, I would be the first to say I'm guilty of this. The long lists of greetings in particular are flyover territory for expository preachers. <laughs> Greet whatever that guy's name is, and him, and, Hermie, and, 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 and Hermes, and whatever those guys' names are, right? The congregation is probably snoring already. And yet such passages can on occasion furnish us with beautiful examples of coincidence without design. Romans chapter 16. Romans chapter 16, look at verse 3. Greet Priscilla and Aquila, my helpers in Christ, Jesus, who, who have for my life laid down their own necks. Unto whom not only I give thanks, but also all the churches of who? Gentiles. The Gentiles. Okay? So first, the fact that this greeting appears in the epistle to the Romans suggests that Priscilla and Aquila are inhabitants of that what? If they are not in Rome when he writes that, does that make any sense? No. So hold your hand there and go to Acts 18. Verse 2. Verse 1 says, After these things Paul departed from Athens and came to Corinth, and found a certain Jew named Aquila, born in Pontus, watch, lately come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because that Claudius had commanded all Jews to depart from where? Rome, and came unto them. Okay, so... Priscilla and Aquila were originally inhabitants of what city? Rome, right? Perhaps recently, perhaps recently returned under the expulsion under Claudius ceased to be enforced. So this is one point of coincidence. So we know that they originally were from Rome, that they left because of Claudius, right? But we know that when Paul writes the book of Romans, where are they? They're back where? They're back in Rome, okay? Look at Acts 18.3. And because he was of the same craft, he abode with them and wrought, and wrought, for by their occupation they were tent makers. Look at verse 18. And Paul after this tarried yet a good while, and took his leave of the brethren, and sailed thence into Syria, and with him Priscilla and Aquila, having shorn his head in Centuria, for he had a vow. So when he leaves Corinth there, 
Who does he take with him? Okay, so let's look at the notes. Again, from Acts 18, we find that Paul stayed with them. What did that go back? You should have Romans 16, right? Go back to Romans 16. Verse 3, greet Priscilla and Aquila, my helpers in Christ Jesus, who, who have for my life laid down their own necks, unto whom not only I give thanks, but also all the churches of the Gentiles. So we now know, number one, we know if they were originally from Rome. Now we learn that Paul stayed with them in Acts 18.3, and when he left, they departed with him in verse 18. From this it would be a fair inference that they were fellow workers with him, Though Paul, though only Paul's greeting in Romans makes this fact what? Do we know from Acts 18 verse 3 that they were in the same occupation? They're tent makers, right? Shake your head, yes, we know that, right? Do we know from verse 18 that when Paul left, they went with him? Do we know from Romans 17 that Paul calls them co-workers or fellow workers? I'm sorry, Romans 16. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> okay. Fourth, Paul indicates that the churches of the Gentiles give thanks for them. Given the themes of the entire epistle, uh, sorry, the entire letter, this singling out of the Gentiles seems to have, seems to have more than ordinary significance. And going back to Acts 18.2, we find Aquila was a Jew expelled from Rome when the Emperor Claudius... Uh, <coughs> Exasperated. exasperated with riots in the Jewish quarter, then that, that had something to do with a fellow named uh, that is Christ, decided to evict the Jews. Yet they were working with Paul, who in this very city declared that he was turning from the Jews to the Gentiles, and from that time forward conducted a highly effective mi uh, mission among them. Now, go, go back to Acts 18. So Priscilla and Aquila are Jews from where? Why are they in Corinth? They get expelled from Rome, right? What does Paul do in Corinth? Verse 4, and he, reasoned, and he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath day and persuaded the Jews and Greeks. And when Silas and Timotheus were come from Macedonia, Paul was pressed in his spirit and testified uh, to the Jews that Jesus was the Christ. And when they opposed themselves and blasphemed, he shook his raiment and said unto them, Your blood be upon your own heads. I am clean. From henceforth I will go unto who? The Gentiles. So, do, do they harbor Paul? Do they help Paul? Do they give Paul sanctuary in Corinth while he's doing these things and ministering among the Gentiles? Do they later on in the passage teach Apollos the way of God more perfectly based upon the information that they learned from who? Paul. So go back to the notes. So I'm almost, I'm about three quarters of the way through that last paragraph. Yet they were working with Paul who in this very city, that would be Corinth, declared that he was turning from the Jews to the Gentiles. We just read that. And from that time forward, conducted a highly effective mission among them. So, Aquila and Pris so Priscilla and Aquila, though Jews, took part in the ministry to the Gentiles. And that is how they entered into, and that is how they earned the thanks of the Gentile churches. Go back to Romans 16, verse 1. Romans 16, verse 1. I commend, uh, I commend unto you Phoebe, our sister, which is a servant of the church, which is at Centuria. Okay? So if you look at my notes, why command a servant of the church at, why commend a servant at the church at Centuria? Paul, Paul is writing apparently from Corinth, perhaps Centuria is is then in the neighborhood of Corinth. That's an awkward way of saying it, but so hold your hand there and go back to Acts 18. <clears throat> Acts 18, 18, and Paul after this tarried there yet a good while and then took his leave of the brethren and sailed from thence into Syria, and with him Priscilla and Aquila, having shorn his head, where? Hmm. 
Okay? For he, for he had a vow. So we find from the book of Acts that Paul himself, upon leaving Corinth, visited where? Okay. So thus, the apparently barren lists of greetings furnish us with numerous points of indirect correspondence, consistency, and even harmony, but without verbal borrowing with the events and historical narrative of Acts. Folks, I don't know what your opinion is about all of this stuff, but this stuff just fascinates me. That, you, that, that when God moved upon a certain author to write, that author wrote the very words that God wanted written down, knowing what he was going to have the next guy what? Right. right. And that in the end, he would establish this interlocking book that gives its own internal evidence to the fact that it only could have been written by who? By God. Okay, to me, that's amazing. We've got a couple more examples here. We've got about 20 minutes left, so hopefully you're not bored with this. The fifth example is the life and journeys of Timothy. So come with me to 1 Corinthians 4. <clears throat> 1 Corinthians 4. We'll just get these in order here. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 17. <coughs> Paul says this. For this cause have I sent unto you Timotheus, who is my beloved son and faithful in the Lord, who, sh who shall bring you into remembrance of my ways, which be in Christ, as I teach everywhere in every church. Okay? So Paul explains that he has sent Timothy unto the Corinthians. From that passage alone, however, we cannot tell whether he sent him before the letter or with it. Okay? In which case, the language of sending would be an anticipation of the act. Okay? So in other words, when Paul writes that, has Timothy already what? Has he already left? Or does he write it and send it with him? Does everybody, does everybody see the difference, right? So what you're looking at there in that verse is when he says in verse uh, 17, For this cause... Have I sent unto you Timotheus? Does he, does he say that anticipating that he's going to send him with the letter? Or has he already what? Sent, sent him. Okay. Go to, go to chapter 16. The verse, the verse 17 says he sent it, not send it. Yeah, there might be a discrepancy there, only simply because uh, McGrew is not using a King James Bible when he's um, writing this out. But I'm going to have to look at that. So, Sylvia, make a note of that for me to check into that. <clears throat> go, go to 1 Corinthians 16, look at verse 10. Now, now, if Timotheus come, see... Now, now let's stop there. Does chapter, does chapter 4 say he sent him? Okay. Now he says in the end of the book, chapter 16, he says, Now if Timotheus come, <clears throat> see, that, see that he may be with you without fear, <clears throat> for he worketh the work of the Lord, as I also do. Let no man therefore despise him, but conduct him forth in peace, that he may come unto me, for, uh, for I look for him with the brethren. So this verse makes it plain that Timothy... That Paul had sent Timothy before writing what? The letter. Thus chapter, thus chapter 4 says that he what? That he sent him, right? Okay. So the, chapter 16 makes it plain that Paul had sent Timothy before writing the letter as he speaks of Timothy's arrival as something independent from their receipt of the letter itself. Okay. But by the comparison of these two passages, raise it raises an interesting question. If Timothy had been sent first, why should he not arrive what? Second. 
first. first. Uh, everybody understand that. Has he already sent him before he wrote the letter? Yes. Okay. So if Timothy were sent before the letter, why would Timothy not arrive in Corinth before what? The letter. The letter. That's the question that that should arise, right? If, if he arrived first... What use would it be to send after the fact instructions about how they were to receive him? So in other words, does Paul fully anticipate that the letter will get to them before who? Before Timothy. If he doesn't, then why does he instruct him at the end about how they should receive who? Timothy. That wouldn't make any sense if he expects Timothy to get there before the letter, right? The only plausible resolution is that Timothy, though sent first, must have taken some indirect route to Corinth. The fastest method of travel from Ephesus, where Paul was writing to Corinth, would, would be to take a ship. With a fair wind, the journey between the two cities on opposite sides of the, the archipelago or the Aegean uh, would, 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 uh, can be made in a very short time. Go to Acts 19. Acts 19, verse 21. And after these things were ended, Paul purposed in his spirit, when he had passed through Macedonia and Achaia, to go to Jerusalem, saying, After I have been there, I must, see Rome, I must also see Rome. So he sent into Macedonia two of them that ministered unto him, Timotheus and Erastus, but he himself stayed in Asia for a what? For a season. So we discover that Timothy... We discover that Timothy, when he left Ephesus, took the land route and went up through Macedonia. You see that? Look at, look at verse 22 again. And he sent into Macedonia two of them that ministered unto him. Why would the letter get there before Timothy? Because Timothy is going a different direction by what? By land. So if Paul sends the letter on a sea route across the Aegean Sea... Is he going to get there before Timothy shows up traveling over land? Yeah. Okay, so go back to the notes. Here, once again, we have a characteristic of undesigned coincidence that neither the historical account nor the letters could, poss could plausibly be said to have been written, written up from the other. The letter does not mention Timothy's journeys through Macedonia at all. The book of Acts does not mention Paul's letter. But what we find in the book of Acts is the only plausible way of reconciling those stray statements Paul makes in the letter. So Paul makes these statements in the letter and you're like, what in the world's going on here? Why? Why would, why would the letter show up before Timothy? If Timothy were sent, what? Before the letter were done. Well, the book of Acts answers that and tells you that, well, the reason for that is because Timothy went a different way. Timothy goes a, a land route. He goes over land, up into Macedonia and around, instead of going straight across by sea. If he went straight across by sea, would he have certainly arrived then before the letter? Okay, so again, Acts explains the stray statements that are in 1 Corinthians and helps you understand them. <clears throat> Last point on page 5. It is not always so in historical work. Jordan's life of Erasmus, for example, is framed almost entirely from Erasmus' letters. And, from ju and for just that reason, it gives us virtually nothing that can be found, that cannot be found, excuse me, in the letters themselves. There is much parallel material between the letters and Jordan's biography. But there, is, but there is no interlocking. Coincidences do not qualify as undesigned. So in other words, what he's saying there is what Jordan did to write the biography of Erasmus is he sat down and he had Erasmus' letters in front of him. And so he writes the biography out of Erasmus' what? Letters, right? So does he have, does he have the... The letters of Erasmus, the history in front of him to draw from to write the biography. So when you compare the biography to the letters, it doesn't match. Yeah, because he wrote the biography from what? But Luke doesn't have all Paul's letters in front of him when he writes the book of Acts. So you don't have the same phenomenon that you would have if the historian is writing the biography out of the letters. Does everybody understand why that's important?
It's just another, it's just another evidence here that the Acts... Luke writes Acts independent of anything Paul says in, Paul, in, in, the, in the epistles. Okay? All right, we've got one more example here. Oh, wait, I'm not done with that one. Go to 2 Timothy 3. This is one that I think most of you probably have observed before. We've studied verse 16 a lot. Haven't said much about verse 15 yet. But in verse 15 it says, And that from a child thou hast known the Holy Scriptures. So who, that's Paul writing to who? Timothy. Timothy. Which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith, faith which is in Christ Jesus. Clearly, this is a reference, this would have to be a reference to the Jewish what? Scriptures here. Okay? If, Paul's, if Timothy's going to have known them from his childhood... He's largely referring here to the Old Testament books. Okay? So clearly this is a reference to the Jewish Scripture, but Paul gives no clues as to how Timothy, who was not circumcised until after his conversion as a young man in Acts 16.3, had acquired such knowledge. Hold your hand there and go over to, go over to Acts 16. So Paul doesn't tell you, does Paul go into a long dissertation and say, let me explain to you, let, let, let me remind you, Timothy, how you learn this stuff. No. no, he just says it. Acts 16, verse 1. Then he came to Derbe and Lystra, and behold, a certain disciple there named Timotheus, now watch, the son of a certain woman which was a Jewess. And believed, but his father was what? How did he know the scriptures from the time he was a child? His mother, who was a Jewish, the Jewess, did what? Taught it to him. And what did it say back there in 2 Corinthians 3? I, I, I let it go. Somebody read it. Read verse 15, if you got it. 2 Timothy 3.15. And that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures which are able to make you wise in salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. How did he know it from a child? His mother. He had a mother who was a Jewess that taught it to him. Okay? So again, you see more interlocking. So his mother made sure he was instructed in the scriptures of her people. So again, just another example. And then the last one I have here. It's just a point that Acts was not written by somebody copying Paul's letters, which is sort of a follow-on from what we just looked at in the last point. <clears throat> so, a life as rich in travel and relationships as Paul was, documented both by his letters and by the history of the book of Acts, affords many opportunities for undesigned coincidences to emerge. So many, in fact, that it is worth pausing to see some of the evidence that Acts was not written by someone who had Paul's letters before him. Leafing through 2 Corinthians, we notice how cons conspicuous a part is played by, Tim by Titus. He is named multiple times. See chapters 7 and 8 in particular. We're not, don't, don't, well, go to chapter 8, verse 23. Go to 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 23. Pardon the illustration, but Paul seems to me to be like Pastor Lee. Knows a lot of people from everywhere. Okay? Verse 23. Whether any do inquire of who? Titus. Titus. He is my partner and fellow helper concerning you. Or our brethren be inquired, be inquired of they are messengers of the churches in the glory of Christ. So go back to the notes. Um, Paul describes him in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 23 as my partner and fellow helper concerning you. Yet in the book of Acts, his name does not appear even once. Acts never mentions Titus. Okay? It would be a poor fabricator who could not make more of his material than this. 
Yet in real historical documents, the omission of some person or event that we could hardly imagine ourselves omitting is quite common. If the writer of Acts has Paul's epistles in front of him, would he and, and Titus plays such a big role in Paul's, in Paul's letters with one even addressed to him, how in the world do you write the chronology of the book of Acts and not say anything about who? About Titus. Okay? Or consider Paul's enumeration of his sufferings in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 24 and 25. He says, Thrice was I beaten with rods. But only one of those occasions makes it into the Acts history. Okay? Thrice I suffered shipwreck. A night and the day I have, I have been in the deep. What an opportunity to tell a set of dramatic tales. Yet not one of these three is mentioned in the book of Acts where the one disastrous void... Let me start over. What an opportunity to tell a set of dramatic tales. Yet not one of these, yet not one of these three is mentioned in the book of Acts, where one disastrous voyage that is recounted takes place years after the letter was penned. Does everybody follow the point there? When he writes 2 Corinthians, he's all, within the Acts chronology, he's already saying he was shipwrecked how many times? Three. And the one that Luke does record is in Acts 27 after the book of 2 Corinthians has been what? Written. And yet he says nothing about the previous three. You following that? Okay. Or compare the account of Paul, or compare the, the account Paul gives of his escape from Damascus in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 32 through 33. We don't have time to look at all these verses now, so I'll just commend these references to you, with the account of the same adventure in Acts chapter 9, verses 23 through 25. The main facts are the same, but the differences make it perfectly clear that the history was not written up from the letter. In 2 Corinthians, for example, Paul says that um, Artis ha uh, had the city guarded, though there is no information as to who did the guarding. In Acts, we are told that the Jews kept watch at the gates for Paul, uh, for which they probably needed to leave, probably needed the leave of the, um, how do you say this word? Ethnarch, yet Erastus goes unnamed. So the position, Erastus is the guy's name, right? True, it is not hard to reconcile these statements, and then he gives you the Latin prima facie and all that stuff. As the saying goes, he, he, uh, he who does a thing by another does it, uh, does it himself, but here again, it is not credible to suggest that the author of Acts wrote his history from the letter. The same manifest independence is visible in 1 Corinthians as well. Consider all of the problems that this one, I love this one. Consider all the problems that the church at Corinth had written about. Problems to which Paul replies in 1 Corinthians chapter 7 and 8. Why don't you go there quick. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 7. Verse 1, <clears throat> he says, Now concerning, concerning the things whereof ye wrote unto me, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. So what does he start addressing in chapter 7? The things that they wrote him about, right? But what chapter are you in there? You're in 7. He doesn't even start answering their questions until what chapter? 7. seven. So go back to the notes. <coughs> Paul replies in 1 Corinthians 7 and 8, problems about marriage, about calling, about the unmarried, about food offered to idols. It is wholly natural that they should make these inquiries of Paul and wholly natural that he should reply to them. Yet in the book of Acts we find no trace of these problems at Corinth. And the one place that the question of food offered to idols is touched upon, the Jerusalem Council arguably enjoins something stricter than Paul himself, writing later than the event imposes. Okay, So the Jerusalem Council, were they more strict about food offered to idols than Paul is in 1 Corinthians? <laughs> okay, So go to the top of page 7. All of these passages provide evidence that the history was written independently of these letters. 
their numerous coincidences, the numerous coincidences between them, some of which we have already seen in this series and some of which we will be looking at in subsequent installments, are therefore genuinely undesigned. And that is why they provide evidence of their substantial trustworthiness. One more, one more touch, and I love this, on the verisimilitude of 1 Corinthians itself, noted by Paley in his, in his Hor Paulinae, though not really an undesigned coincidence, deserves attention. Paul begins chapter 7 with a reference to earlier correspondence, uh, now lost, now having concerning the, now concerning the things whereof you should say ye wrote unto me. The issues they have raised, however foreign to us, are the sorts of things that we can well imagine arising at a young church of the time. But other parts of the letter reveal that there are even greater and more embarrassing problems that they had not written about, but that Paul had evidently learned from other sources bitter quarreling and divisions, sexual immorality, lawsuits between members of the church. So, I told you when we started 1 Corinthians, right? That Corinthians divides up in between Paul addressing things that are going on there that he heard about and him answering their what? Their questions. Remember we went over that in the introduction to 1 Corinthians, right? But think about it. What do the Corinthians leave out? They write him and they're, all, they're talking about divorce and remarriage and food offered to idols and all this sort of thing. In the meanwhile, what are they leaving out? They're leaving out the man following factions, right? They're leaving out the gross immorality. They're leaving out the lawsuits. And they, so the, the worst stuff that's going on, they don't include in the questions that they send to him. Of course not. Of course not. Why would they not? Why not? Because. They don't want Paul to think badly of them, right? And so they, they do what human nature would be to do, and they try to smooth it over, right? And if not but for Paul's knowledge of what was going on through other sources and means, he wouldn't have, he wouldn't have talked to him about the things he talked to him, talked to him about in chapters 1 through 6. Okay? So what is, <laughs> what is more natural or... Um, I forgot, where did I leave off in this? Right. Sexual immorality, lawsuits. What is more natural or probable then that their letter to Paul should speak of the issues that they did not reflect, that, that, that did not reflect poorly on any of them? While rumor carried to Paul's ears, it is commonly reported, chapter 5, verse 1, on account of the more scandalous matters. This manner of dividing the issues Paul addresses would be most improbable in a forgery. It has the ring of truth. Okay, we're already past time, so let me just read the conclusion. The conclusion, please recall from Lesson 21 last week, that undesigned coincidences demonstrate the reliability of the Bible and demonstrate the following. Number one, the authenticity of the books, that they were written by who they claim to have been written by. And number two, the genuineness of the books, that they are trustworthy history and accurate presentation of the material they report. Okay? So finally, these undesigned coincidences serve as internal proof, then, of the Bible's inspiration. Only a book written under divine inspiration would exhibit characteristics such as these. Now, we don't have a lot of time for questions. We're already almost five minutes past. But next week, we'll look at one more line of internal evidence for inspiration, and that's the issue of fulfilled prophecy. So, I'm sorry there's not more time for questions or comments. If you have one, stop me afterwards, and uh, hopefully you'll be back next week to hear about fulfilled prophecy. Thanks.